what are the current applications with the Moxie that you might not have expected uh, right out of the gate? Some sports that you never thought might benefit from the technology that are now using using it. Just yesterday, I saw there was a study published on elite badminton players, and I just I didn't see that coming. I mean, I, you know, I mean, and, and it, it, I mean, it's a competitive sport and all, but in the U.S., it's more of a it's more of a you know, it's kind of like croquet or something. In the U.S., badminton isn't something that's super competitive. It, it is in other parts of the world. It's a much more mm-hmm. competitive sport, and so that was one that I thought, wow, I never thought anyone would use it for badminton, but they but they do. Uh, and that's this is like the second or third time I've seen badminton. Uh, you know, that, that's been used in that. Uh, the diving is another one I didn't see coming. We've had people use it for like, they, they use it for training for free diving. They, mm. they, they can't use it when they go super deep because the sensor's not built for that kind of pressure, but, um, but they, they can, they can train their breathing, uh, for free diving. And that's another one that I just, yeah, I didn't even think of as a sport really, but then, um, then that, that, uh, uh, that, that was interesting. And then I think some of the military training, and I'm I'm surprised at the level of interest we have there. Or not surprised, but it makes sense when you think about it. But it's one I didn't I didn't see coming up front, I guess. So, what are some of the maybe some of the conclusions that have come out of those different uh, lines of research within sports using the Moxie that maybe you didn't expect, or that people didn't expect in general, and that are slowly changing kind of the way that people see uh, you know training uh, in general when we talk about oxygen and performance. I think the, 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 the biggest shift and, and kind of the, the one that, well, there's maybe two, I guess there's, there's two that are probably really high up there. So one is, is just the notion of lactate. And, Mm -hmm. and uh, I think lactate was used for a long time because it was something that could be measured and it, and it, it was useful and it, and it was, it was the best you could do. uh, But then it kind of grew into an ends of, of its own. It wasn't a means for understanding how the muscles were processing oxygen, it became, it became an end in itself, you know, that the lactate was bad or something. And, and, uh, and, and so Moxie has been, you know, just rolling that back and saying, you know, you, you measured lactate because you wanted to know the muscle oxygen and now we can measure the muscle oxygen directly. Cause there's, there's still people that say, well, how does this correlate to lactate or how do I use this to know the lactate? And it's like, why do you want to know the lactate if you can know the muscle oxygen directly? And, and so that's, that's been one that I think, I think has been a shift. And then the, probably the one that's more fundamental and, and it's, I'd say it's less, you know, the, 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 there's more of a, I don't know, shock value or something or more, it's more controversial with the lactate, but what's less controversial or less, less um, uh, uh, apparent or it's lower level, but I think even more important is the, the, the change in the understanding of energy systems. Hmm. Uh, you know, cause one of the things we can see with Moxie is that you use oxygen immediately when you start exercising uh, because we see it going, you know, we see it going down we see it, you know, you start exercising and as fast as the sensor can take a reading, we're seeing that number go down. And, and, uh, and, and, and you're, you're primarily using oxygen right from the beginning, you know, mm-hmm. it's, so there was this notion that you were anaerobic for a while uh, and until your you know, until your other systems caught up, but that really, that really isn't how it works. Um, and, and so I think that changes a lot with how people think about different types of training, you know, what, what do they call anaerobic versus aerobic? Um, and, and that, that's something that, like I say, it's not like, it's not as in your face as the lactate stuff is, but, but I think it's probably much more important and, and people are really, you know, some of the, some of the pro we did, I did a number of pod podcasts with some, uh, with some pro team sport trainers, you know, working with NBA and NHL athletes. And, uh, and that was one of the things that they brought up over and over again was this, that, that they really had to rethink their energy systems analysis. Once they saw, once they could see in real time, what was happening with the moxie, then they, they had to, they had to reconsider that. And I think that's, I think that's pretty important in, in changing how people are going to train. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. It's something I've been, I've been lucky to, to study for, for the last few months, uh, mostly through Evan Pycon, who's done a lot, of, a lot of work to kind of popularize that new idea or paradigm of, of energy systems. And it's true that at first it just, it just throws you for a loop when all you've learned is, you know, you've got the three energy systems and this is, those are the time domains and this is how you train them. And that, that many intervals, that much, you know, work, work to rest ratios, intensities, all of those things. But I think one of the main things that I took out of it is that 
just because the underlying physiology uh, that we thought was true doesn't make sense anymore doesn't mean that the methods that we use to train our athletes have to change completely, right? I think that's one conclusion that I went to at the beginning and I, I, I literally, literally thought everything I've learned for the last six years is just good to throw out and I have to start back from scratch. Actually, no, the methods are what they are and they do work for most athletes. And we can maybe get into the reasons for, for why there might be some differences in responses depending on, on who you're giving those to. But then it's just the kind of the let's say the theory behind it, the physiology behind it. Uh, and again, it's, it's all dependent on what we can measure at the time. But uh, as far as we, we're concerned now, well, we don't have an anaerobic window. Uh, like you said, oxygen is being used right from the onset of, of effort. And, and that does, you know, throw a lot of people for a loop. Yeah. And I, I think your point is, is really important too, that it, that, that uh, just because that is different and that's way different, it doesn't mean that your training is going to be way different. Because mm-hmm. um, the training worked, people got stronger and faster and and yeah. uh, you know quicker and more powerful and all of that and healthier. Um, that was that all occurred before Moxie existed. So uh, it's not like oh you're doing everything wrong. It, it's 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 much more in the refinement. You know mm. it's it's uh, you you'll have you know, and, and a lot of the academic studies, they'll talk about non-responders. They'll say, you know, well, we, we did this, we did this test and, you know, on average, everybody got better, but then there were these, some people that got just a little worse, actually, they didn't respond to this, this treatment. And some, some other people got way, way better, but on average, everybody got a little better. Um, and, and it's always this, you know, there's always this confounding, you know, well, why is that? Why are there some non response Why do some people not respond to beetroot juice and other people have <laughs> dramatic, you know, and, and that's, that's when, that's when understanding the energy systems are important. When you go, when you kind of peel back that next layer and say, you know, wait a minute, what's, what, what, why did, you know, it's, it's not random why somebody responded and somebody didn't, or it's not, you know, it is knowable and, and, and there, there are ways of understanding it. And this is, this is probably not going to tell you everything you need to know, but at least it'll, it'll give you more insight as to who, you know, what types of people or what, what people in what conditions, how can I predict who's going to respond from what types of training interventions? Have you, have you seen any studies or any work being done around testing somebody's uh, limiters and then applying different training protocols and seeing if the responders and non non responders correlated to what uh, energy or to what systems to what physiological systems were limiting that specific athlete I have not seen that and um, that's a much more difficult study to run than what is typically run um, mm. uh, th- and, and I think you know, and just in general, this is, I've made this comment to quite a number of people, just in general, in the academic space, they tend to not use the data proactively. They tend to use that. They, they, meaning just what you said, where you would, you would measure somebody, use the moxie, measure something about somebody, you know, identify their limiter, identify their, you know, ability to desaturate their, you know, something, their, their recovery rates, Mm -hmm. identify some feature and then say, okay, because of this, you, you should train using the A training method and these other people should train using the B training method and Mm -hmm. then see if that's better. Um, That's the, you know, using the information to, to, inform the training before you do it as mm-hmm. opposed to what what tends to happen is um you know people will say uh you know I, i've got two tra- i've got two groups i'm going to give one group beetroot juice and the other one not and then i'll see if their oxygenation is different you mm-hmm. know and that's not proactive you're seeing well what happened you're not you're not saying you're not saying oh, i'm going to measure their oxygenation first and decide you get beet juice and you don't right. and then see if i can make everybody better instead of instead of having non responders mm-hmm. and that that proactive use is a much much more complicated study to make but i think i think that's you know that, that's that's where the academics need to go to really really uncover the the value of the technology because if you're not using it proactively in training, mm. then what's the point? You know, if you're just saying, well, we trained for six months and now his oxygenation didn't get any better. Well, that's a waste. We want, we want to know before you start training for six months, we want to know how to train so that they do get stronger. And yeah. and that's, that's where the value really is, isn't that in that measure them on day one and then change, you know, structure a training plan based on what you learned in that day one measurement so that they will for sure get better. Mm.